Remains. This is a poem written from the perspective of a soldier stationed in either Iraq or Afghanistan, or any war zone really. They're on patrol and they fire on some bank robbers. One of the looters appeared to possibly have a gun, so they've opened fire. The rest of the poem is looking at the fact that the soldier, even long after this event, cannot leave the memory behind and carries this dead man with him in his mind. The PTSD and mental illness is very common in soldiers who struggle to come to terms with some part of their duty, normally a horrific memory of killing or being in danger, which gives them nightmares and panic attacks, as well as depression and sometimes suicidal tendencies. Simon Armitage is the poet laureate, he is the, meaning he is the national poet. He's known for being very direct in his work. His recent poems have looked mostly at the experiences of war and soldiers within those wars. To start with in this poem, it begins in a very odd way with that on another occasion. So starting structurally, it makes this sound like part of a series. As normal, pink is formal language and yellow is structure. On another occasion, we get sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank. And one of them legs it up the road. And here we have the phrase, legs it. This is a colloquialism. But that use of colloquial phrasing makes it feel informal. Like he's just another story. Probably armed, possibly not. So we cast down immediately. So I've got that pink. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us. And here we have repetition. And the repetition here of all and then the three. And further down we have that all again. So that repetition there it wasn't it shows it's not just him. It shows us that he's feeling guilty. And I swear oh, we've switched now to I. Swear, that poetic voice now, it suddenly becomes much more personal. It makes it keen, it makes it sound like he's almost trying to tell his version of the story. Moving on to the next stanza. I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. We've got several different things to think about in those first two lines. To start with, we have the repetition of I see. It just shows us that visual horror. But then we look at this part here, we have, as it rips through his life. And it's a violent metaphor. Now, it really contrasts the tone of the first two stanzas. The second line then, we have broad daylight on the other side. So here we have this really grotesque image. 
A really horrendous, vivid, disgusting image. It really exaggerates what's happened. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. And here we have this really interesting way that this colloquial language again, almost childish. It's like... Split them. He cannot process. What happened? Looking then at the start of the fourth stanza. Pain itself. The image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. And that's really quite... Shocking for us as a reader because they're so casual in the way that they just sort of toss his dead body into the lorry. So it's two very casual cold actions. It shows a, a lack of respect. And you've also got this carted off in the back of a lorry. To me, possible reference to Dulce Decorum Est. Where the narrator's friend in that poem is just tossed into the back of a cart to die from the po from the poisoning gas. At the end of this stanza and the start of the next stanza we have the vault of the poem. So now end of the story except not really. He's gone home. So this is the vault. The mood has changed as well. His blood shadow stays on the street and it's this, it's going to haunt him. And out on patrol, I walk right over it week after week, but then I'm home on leave. And it's suddenly very short, this short, this simple sentence. He, it almost like makes us think that once he's home, he'll forget these things, but he doesn't. You've also got the brevity or the shortness of the line. Hints at his confusion. And then we have, but I blink and the stanza ends reflecting the blinking that enjambment then carries you forwards and the horror is still there when the next stanza starts so the end of the stanza
reflects blinking itself. And then carrying straight on to the next page, onto the last two last three stanzas. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank, sleep, and he's probably armed, possibly not, dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds, and the drink and drugs won't flush him out. We've got lots going on here. There's lots to think about with the repetition of sleep and dream, that semantic feel that's being created here. And the short, the short words, separated, shout, sound like gun, from the rest of the line, sound like gunshots. And he's probably armed, possibly not. And it's that repetition here. And it's repeated from earlier. Shows his guilt. And it also shows that it's haunting him. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. So he's trying to get rid of him. He's trying to get get rid of it, but it can't. So I would say here he is spiralling down. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant sun stunned sand smothered land. Or six feet under in desert sand. And that dug in behind enemy lines, that really nice metaphor that we've got there, shows that it's the memory is stuck in his head. And not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned and sand-smothered land. So we've got the violent parts of the com compound adjectives here. Stunned and smothered. Show how the place has been affected by war. And the long line and the sibilance slow the pace and reflect the speaker's lack of clear thought. But near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Three things to say just about that last line. And here we start with his bloody life. So we could have that double meaning. So it could be blood, as in guilt. But it could also be blood as in that mild swear he's almost cursing in anger we have the possessive adjective in my bloody hands shows us that he feels responsible and my bloody hands and that reference to bloody hands you should have picked up from Macbeth. Think about Lady Macbeth and Macbeth and the way they behave after they've murdered Duncan. And this also suggests, so that alludes 
to him being. Unhinged by guilt. Like Lady Macbeth was. So the themes to think about for today. Two themes today. First one of nonchalance. So it's a casual attitude. Towards the death. And we also have that contrasting feeling of guilt. And the speaker can't get the memory out of his of the death out of his head. The comparative notes, so going back to the first page, the poems that I compare it to up at the top. Lots to think about. Certainly the idea of memory would be compared to kamikaze. And we can talk about the effect slash experience of conflict and there's lots to think about here. You can think about poppies. You could think about bayonet charge. And you could think about also the way that war photographer has that effect as well.